uh, on that note, how about we just go ahead and jump in because we have with us, um, we have a guy who knows a thing or two about programming in assembly. I believe you, you coded a program or two, right, Steve? Oh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> he banged a few things out on a couple of keys and, you know. Banged a few bits around in the day. <laughs> yep. did, a did a couple of shifts left, shift rights, and um, next as thing you know. As long as they're not uh, <laughs> an overflow. arithmetic. <laughs> Arithmetic. <laughs> How many programmers have programs written about them? Uh -huh. How many programmers have? Oh, okay. All right. I was a little slow there, Ron. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that was Ron Delvo. Yes. What's Ron going to pull out of his beard this week? Uh <laughs> <laughs> it came from Ron's beard. I'm cool. All right. Oops. Okay. <laughs> On to programming and assembly now, please. This is a serious program here. All yeah. right, so um, we're now at lesson twelve. When did 12. that happen? <laughs> Everybody, shut up! Uh, <laughs> Steve Bjork, you have the floor. Okay. Well, lesson twelve is we're writing a bit bigger program this time, and last time we simply had a uh, dot moving around the screen. We're actually going to move a pong ball, and we're going to move three of them. And each one's going to run in an independent speed from each other. Ooh. So we're going to be, the main thrust of this is to talk about um, how do you have, you know, three unique items that's moving on the screen, but try and keep it so that you're not writing code for each one of those. That's a great and, question. Yeah. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to do in this one. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Source code link. First Source of all, code. before we get a, a, a we're going, uh, you can download the source code to our lesson. And I also have the uh, program already compiled and set up inside of a, um, a disk image. So you can run it in VCC right away. So if you want to take a look at it. And um, the source code is Pong1, because eventually when we get done here, we're going to have a Pong game. Very simple game, but it demonstrates a lot. And um, the, as I said, the assembly.disk is the um, file that you'll put in your Cocoa Disk folder, and you can uh, basically load it in as your disk on uh, VCC. So it, it gives you a chance to see what we're doing, but it'll have three balls go off in random speeds, random directions, and move around on the screen. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. We're gonna still stay with our P mode four screen. That's the 256 dot across by 192 scan lines. The actual dots that we did last week are going to be replaced by an eight dot across by seven scan line high ball sprites. Ooh. So um, we will also have three balls on the screen. As I said before, they're moving at, they're moving at unique speeds and they'll bounce off the walls of the screen. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Yes, I can't wait to see it. Okay. Um, this time we're gonna be looking at 256 positions going across the screen. Last time we did 128, just to kind of make things simple. But really, mm -hmm. we have, it's a black and white mode, which means the dots are either on or off. And <laughs> there is eight dots per byte. So what we need to do to have this bright image move across the screen smoothly is not only do we have to move it every byte, but we have to move it every bit in a byte. Okay, so what this is going to be similar to like an ASL or an ASR where we'll be shifting the bits, but I'm imagining you're going to do it slightly different than that for efficiency or performance? Uh, yes, I'm going to actually create a total of eight images. Each image is one shifted over. Okay. Since they're already shifted, it'll make it faster for when we actually draw the image on the screen. Mm -hmm. so, so no actual bit shifting. So we're always putting things on a byte boundary. You got it. Okay. You know, that's the way the graphic memory works. Let's do it that way so things go work. As I said, there's 32 bytes in a, uh, a cross in a P mode 4 screen. 
and there's 192 scan lines. And like last week, we're looking at a screen that has 6,144 bytes. Okay. Yep. All right. Now, uh, besides the sprites, we'll also be introducing some other new concepts. Uh, we'll be, of course, drawing sprites on the screen. You know, that's going to be important. We have to be able to erase the sprites off the screen so that uh, when we move the uh, sprite from one location to another, you have to remove the old one before you draw the new one. Mm -hmm. uh, then one of the most important things we're going to talk about is object data structures. These are the bits of information that holds like the position and status of each of our balls. Okay. And what we will do is the data structure has a starting point. All the things are the same as far as position information and other things in it. And we will just simply pass to the routine that's going to draw the ball or move the ball or the other things we're going to do with it. We're going to point them to the beginning of that data structure. That way the code knows exactly where to get it even though it's a different ball each time. We'll go more into detail on that. And of course, the last is going to be random numbers. Mm. Now, um, as I said before, we're going to be using uh, data objects. Um, this is similar to what you've got in higher level lang uh, languages like C++ and like that. It's basically object-oriented coding. Uh, this block of memory holds the information of the object. Each block layout is the same as the others. That's something that I find very easy in assembly language is that if we make the object block identical from one to the next, just makes the code easier to read, understand, and more importantly, write without bugs. Mm -hmm. Um the other thing that it'll do is it'll save space, it'll, you know, and, and like that. So let's just go ahead and get to the next slide. Uh, for this lesson, we're going to use a very simple object. It's going to have nothing more in it than a control byte, the position information for the X and Y, and the speed that it's moving on the X and Y, a total, total of nine bytes. But the first byte's very important. It is basically the control or status byte of this particular object. In other words, we got to know if the object's in use, if the object can be moved or drawn. These are just status control bits up there because sometimes you might have in a more elaborate game, you might have an object that does work, but it doesn't draw anything on the screen. So you wouldn't uh, tell it that you're going to draw. Well, anyways, let's let's start taking a look at the different bits that I've set up in the control byte that mean something. They are flags, they're either set or reset. And bit six, and I'm using the binary representation, that byte of where bit six is. This is basically whether or not this particular object is in use. Uh, this comes very handy because if you have to create a new object, you look for an object that's not in use and then take it over. Can I just interrupt you real quick? You're yeah. saying bit six, but it looks like bit seven is the one that's turned on in the example here. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's okay. I put too many zeros zero. in. Yeah. So, um, but it is bit six. Okay. So there was an extra bit, there was an extra bit to the right that's not supposed to be there. Yeah. Okay. So it is bit six. Well, Bit six. Okay. Um, yeah, the bits are labeled zero to seven, I think is what is confusing you, Steve. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. It's not one yeah, date. Zero is the one furthest to the right. Okay, all right. Yeah. Next to next yeah. the last bit. So seven yeah. is the highest bit, zero through yeah. seven. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. So, okay, so that, that one is correct. Good. Okay. Anyways, um, okay, bit five, I've used that one to decide whether or not this object moves. In other words, should it call the move routine? And bit four is used whether or not to decide if the object should be drawn. Now, in this very simple setup, all of them are going to be drawn, all of them are going to move, but I'm trying to set up something that's going to be useful for later in the game. 
as far as these definitions. Now, bit seven, which is the most significant bit, I use that as a flag whether or not we've hit the end of our list. And this allows me to just simply go through the list of objects. And when I hit the last potential one, I basically put a 128 or in other words, have bit seven set. And that tells me that I've hit the end of the list, don't go any further. So think of it as an end flag. Okay. All right. And some of the other bits will be used for other control functions later. All right, continuing right along. Um, the next two bytes is the 16-bit exposition. Remember in our last uh, example of moving things around on a screen, the 16 bits, which is two bytes, the most significant byte is used as the whole number, like an integer number of the position. Ah, okay. okay. And and the um, other eight bits or the byte, second byte, that's used as the fractional. Okay, so this is the quick and dirty floating point. You got it. Yeah, fixed point. Okay. Fixed point. And, okay. Uh, of course, then we got the Y position following that. And then we have the X and, X and Y delta, which is the speed. That's set up the same way. The upper byte is the whole number, and the lower byte is the fractional. Okay, so your first byte is kind of like that condition code that the processor mm -hmm. already has. You're, you're using a series of flags within one byte to represent a, a variety of things. And then right. you just reserved a few other things for your deltas and speeds and stuff. Okay. We could use separate bytes to represent each one of them, mm -hmm. but uh, then it makes the object larger. And let's put it this way on when, you know, when you're working on microprocessors, you want to keep things small and efficient. Gotcha. That's what she said. All yep. right. So here we go. And that's what it looks like. It's the first byte zero is the control status byte. Mm -hmm. Byte one is the X position. Byte three is the Y position. Uh, then we've got the delta for the X and the Y following it. So there's a total of nine bytes in each of these objects. Okay. The objects will get more complicated as we go through our lesson. By the way, it's going to be your work assignment to um, take a look at the source code that I've given you and study it. Think you're back in college where the professor <laughs> only highlights everything. It's up to you to study hard. Okay. The only thing is you don't have to go buy the books. There you go. All right. All right. So what we do is we just pass this object data block um, you know, and, and by having each data block having different information in it, we can have different things going on the screen at the same time. This this kind of, kind of simplifies the code for having three balls on the screen. Otherwise, what you would have to do is if you had ball one and direct page, ball two and direct page, ball three, you would have to have separate routines for each one of those balls because you're mm -hmm. referencing a different location. By having these objects set up and passing it the in the U register, the beginning of that particular object, the same code works on all three. As I said, it just makes life easier for doing this. I'm going to say that a lot because this is the important part of the lesson is using these objects to uh, make things happen. All right, next slide. This here is how I laid out the memory inside the Coco for our particular uh, game. And I would like to spend a moment going through each one of them. Okay. Uh, the first 256 bytes is the direct page. That's that shorthand page where uh, you don't have to give the entire address. You can just give it uh, one byte addressing for the particular variable that you're looking up. And we've used that before in the... Um, other program, but we're continuing with that. Uh, the next 256 bytes is our object data section. This is where we put our different object blocks in memory. Got to have a place for it. Um, from then the uh, 3000 to um, 3000 FF, that's our stack space. Now we haven't done anything with that too much before, but we have a stack inside the CPU. That's where we save information, like when we do a um, go to subroutine. Mm 
you got to save the information where you came from so you know where to go back to. Uh, sometimes you want to temporarily save some information. Well, you use the uh, stack to s temporarily put information like a uh, the value of a register on the stack by pushing it. And then to restore it, you do a pull. Make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So that's our stack space. It's more than enough for this particular program. And then starting at, by the way, these are all hex numbers. I should mention that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, oops, made a mistake on this one. The 4, 000, uh, 400 hex, that should have gone to uh, 1BFF. I'm sorry, that's got a 19FF. Okay. Hit the, hit the wrong key there, but all right. Then we've got the next screen, which is 1C00231 FF. These are 6K screens, and that's why those numbers are a little funny um, looking, but that's what they are. Then we've got to have a space to build that sprite I talked about. Yep. Uh, because in the code, I include the original, and then in RAM, I got to build the other seven of that uh, spray of the ball. Okay. And that's what that space is for. Okay. And then I talked briefly about the fact that we have to be able to erase the ball off the screen after it's been drawn so we can draw it in a new position. Uh, that's what these erase buffers are for. Erase data buffer one and two. They allow us to erase the uh, information, the ball off the screen by taking what was on the screen before it was changed, before it was changed. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, from 3800 to 3FFF, not using all this space, but that's where I currently put the program. By doing out this layout this way, I've made this program work on as small as a 16K Coco. Okay. Because 16K stops at 3FFF. Okay. Okay, any questions? No, we're just kind of, you're just basically outlining where things are going to go, right? right? So this is the, the kind of the blueprint or the outline to... Yeah, the yeah, memory map for the... Yeah, memory, memory map. map for the yeah, and honestly, I've never had to deal with a memory <clears throat> map, but in in doing networking, we've got to do like IP network maps all the time. So we do a similar thing. We've got a finite number of resources for our different IP addresses. We're going to reserve this block for switches and routers, another block for printers, you know, and so the, it's not a foreign concept to me to have to take a series of things and create logical groupings within that series. But this mm -hmm. is the first time I've seen it applied to the actual RAM of a system. But other than that, I, I kind of get it. And it makes that makes sense. And it's you're being very proactive at this point. Right. Um, so, yeah. you know, th this is something that you always want to do. It's in the source code. This what you see right here. Mm -hmm. And the, it, you want to kind of make sure that you've got some sort of documentation on how you're putting this all together. Yeah. <clears throat> and it really helps with debugging later, too, because you can start checking, like, if you have a register that's supposed to be pointing, say, to the erase data buffer screen one, and you take a look at the register there because your program's screwing up and crashing, and it says, like, 5,000, we can go, well, that's not supposed to be there. So you can kind of tell when you're looking at this, you know, if something's going snaky on you, you can figure out what's happening. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So this is a good layout for that. All right. Um, at the beginning of the source code, when you look it over, it's going to have definitions about the Coco hardware. In other words, I'm setting up names for referencing things like ports and locations and stuff like that. And by using labels for the uh, hardware locations, it makes the code easier to understand. Like the video port, when you're setting up the video port in the Coco, I use a name to describe the video port, not FF22 throughout the entire program. <coughs> so it's almost like, almost like a variable. It's, it's like a variable. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's yeah. almost self-documenting at that point. Yeah, self-document. Yeah. Makes it a lot easier. Uh, then I set up the graphic screens definitions, the memory layout definitions, the... Uh, uh, object data format and the direct page. So when you look at the source code, that's each section. It does describe what's going on as far as setting it up. All right. 
let's talk about what, the way the program is laid out, how we're going to do things here, what it's going to do in what order. Uh, first part of the program is actually the data sprite for the ball. This is not code that gets executed. It's actually data. And why don't we jump to the next slide for a second, and we'll come back to the other slide. All right, this is the data that I talked about for the sprite, the first, what they, what's known as the zero offset within the byte. And the way I've laid out the data is the first byte is the mask. That's what you kind of like do that cookie cutter thing on the screen, cut yeah. out where the dots are going to go. Right, so here I can see like a circle made out of zeros in the middle of a buffer of ones. So this is right. the this is the negative mask. Right. right. Now the uh, second byte, yeah. that's that's actually the image that we're trying to yep. put. Yeah, and that's the ones. These are the positives. Right, and mm -hmm. that'll put that'll put the dot one on the screen. It'll make it go. Now, mm -hmm. if you notice, there's another two bytes after it. All yeah, ones. Yeah, that's yep. Yeah, so that's a solid mask, and that's an empty mask. Right. And the reason why I did that is we're going to be shifting everything over by one when the program builds uh, ball sprite one, ball sprite two, ball sprite, all the other seven sprites that have to be built to make it so we can have it move within that byte of mm -hmm. graphics. So, so you're going to have one pixel smoothness on this. You got it. Okay. And let's go back to the previous slide. Um, so after, you know, it makes up, let's see, uh, each ball sprite, seven across, I mean, is eight dots across, seven scan lines high. Um, it will build into a RAM the other seven positions. And I guess that's really about it. You're going to shift the data to the right each time because it's going to yep. move to the right. Yeah, I mean, you could pre <clears throat> you could predefine them in the data code too, but then you have to manually mask them all out and figure them all out. <clears throat> where it's much easier in this case just to have the program do it for you. Too now, much back Canadian, in the, too back much in the day, <laughs> back in the day when I was working on cartridge games, the way we would do it is we would have just the graphic image for that zero position in the ROM. And then we would build, in the case of a four-color screen, there would be three other positions we need. We would build the three other in the RAM. That way we're saving on ROM space. And the smaller we could make the ROM, the more money we got from micro, I mean, from Tandy. <laughs> you know, because if we could save the money on the cartridge costs, then we're fine. So why don't we go down to slide 16 Yep, that's the one. Uh, the program, the first thing it does is it shuts off the interrupts because we're going to actually play around with interrupts in this program. We're going to have our own interrupt routine. So we want to shut down the interrupts and reset the stack so that we're under the control of the computer. We're controlling it now. We won't turn the interrupts back on this time, but we will do it later. Uh, then we got some housekeeping work to do, which is initialize the random number generator and just make sure that the random number generator isn't on a bad value, which is all zeros. Because our random number generator will generate anything from 1 to 64K, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, and it'll do it in a random process. And we kind of need that for our game. Uh, it will build the other seven sprites in RAM. It will clear graphics, the graphic screens, and set up the erase buffers so that uh, everything's going with our graphic memory system. And then it'll build our object data blocks of the three balls in the RAM. So that's basically how it goes through and initializes um, the game. Okay. Uh, Let's get to the main loop. This is the thing that we're going to go th cycle through every single time to make these balls move around on the screen. Um, first, what we want to do is uh, 
let's see. A um, couple of notes I, I've got here on the side that I want to make sure I cover. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set up the controls for what screen we're going to work on. Basically, uh, we're using double buffering uh, so that there's no, so we can remove the flickering. If you don't double buffer, there's a chance that your graphics are going to flicker on the screen. So what buffer double buffering is, is you work on one screen while you're displaying another. So that work is erasing things, drawing things, you're, you're playing around with the graphics memory of that screen. And then when that screen is done and ready to go, uh, you then switch which display the computer is displaying. Um, pretty simple and straightforward, I hope. Mm -hmm. But, um, and like that. Now, before drawing the sprites on the screen, you got to remove the old one. So the program will use the erase tables to remove any old sprites on the screen. The way that we got the uh, information to erase with is when we were drawing the sprite on the screen, we were grabbing what was graphically on the screen and copying it into our erase buffer. So what we would do is to erase the old ball we just play back that buffer, that information that we're copying back onto the screen. And of course, there's two sets of erase tables, one for one screen and one for the other. And one more important thing, when we go to erase, we actually have to go backwards. From the bottom up? You got it. In other words, we got to grab the last thing that was erased first, because if we had two of them overlapping, and we did them not in reverse order, if we did it going from front to back, mm -hmm. when we erased the first one. You might have, fine. it might have been in your, in your, in your buffer. Yeah. Well, no, we, we would erase it. But the thing is when we erase the second one, the graphic image of the first one's on the screen. And that would cause it the fact that when he erased the second one, it would put part of that image of the first one back on the screen. So what we have to do is start with the old, the last one drawn first mm -hmm. and work our way back. And that totally erases all the drawn objects off the screen. Gotcha. Now, right now we have a black screen and it seems like a lot of work. We could just simply, you know, put a zero byte in yeah. to clear the screen. But we're going to also pretend that we've got a nice graphics background or something that we don't want to destroy right so that's that's what we're doing there okay okay that, that kind, of, kind of makes sense yep i know i'm hitting a lot of techniques here but yeah no, that's fine okay now uh next up is drawing the sprites on the screen the program will do this by using the u index register to point to the first part of the uh data block so that it knows where to get its information. It will only draw the uh, sprite on the screen if the sprite control bit is set. And um, let's see. And of course, this code is going to run through the entire list of objects until it reaches that end flag that I had set up that says there's no more objects. And that basically tells it what to do. Now, since we've got all the work done, we've erased all the old graphics off, we've drawn the new graphics on there. Now becomes the time that we tell the game system to switch to this screen. And this will tell the interrupt code to actually change the screen. And this interrupt happens on the vertical blank when the screen's not being drawn. This is important because if you just simply change it in the middle of this, you can get kind of a stutter effect or a ghosting effect of the images. But by changing which video screen we're on mm -hmm. during the time that the video display is not being drawn, not you know physically drawn on the computer on the monitor, uh, gives us a nice, clean, solid image. Right. Now, what, is there a time for special effects that you might want to switch screens in the middle, like Canyon Climber and stuff like that, where you have an effect of the screen jittering or you want to generate yep. some type of glitchy look? 
So you yep, might want that, to control that, but in yeah, this yeah. case, we don't. We don't. We want it pure and simple. We want it as clean as possible. Yep. Yep. And get it. Yep. So, and this is another concept that um, I'm introducing. It's basically the centerfor. You don't like. You got the guys out on this ship, and they're putting up the centerfor flags to let you know what's going on, or they're sitting there moving their flags around. This is a, a common technique in computer programming where you set a flag, you set some information and another routine or more importantly, another bit of operation like an interrupt will actually, oh, look at the flag and say, hey, I've got to do something now. And that's exactly what we're doing in this part of the program is that we're telling the interrupt routine which to switch to through the centiphore. Uh, operation so it's a um, powerful technique but uh, can confuse people sometimes because you're switching a flag but it doesn't look like your main code's going to ever um, do anything with touch it, it. Yeah. yeah do anything with it but it's the interrupt routine that's actually going to do something with it and then it's going to send its signal back that it did do something with it okay now that we've told that that interrupt, the next time it comes around, that um, we want to switch screens and we're not drawing, it's a good time to do non-screen work. And yes, there is non-screen work to do in this game. And that is going through the object list and telling the balls to move to their new position. So that the next time we go to draw a screen, we can draw the balls in their new position. Now, once we've gone through and done that little bit of work, we've got to wait for the screen to be switched before we touch that video ramp. And that's where the interrupt routine comes in, is when the interrupt routine happens on that 60 hertz interrupt, it will look at the uh, centiphore flag for switch screen. And if it's zero, it won't do anything. If it's a one, it's going to switch, switch to screen one, and if it's a two, it'll switch the screen two. Okay. And when it's done doing that, it's actually going to put a zero back in that flag so that, A, it won't do it again until the main program tells it to do something. And two, more importantly, by putting a zero there, tells the program that it's done it. So you can see we're using this as a flag or a centiphore not only for the interrupt routine, but something to signal back in the main frame, uh, main routine. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's constantly sending information back and forth through this one little uh, uh, byte in direct page. Okay. Okay. And believe it or not, that is it that we're going to cover now. As I said, I've covered a lot of information here. I've gone over the basics. But much like any uh, computer science class, you got your homework. Download that source code and look it over. Oh, one thing that we should probably do, if you can, Steve, could you run the program? I believe I have the power to do that, um, as He-Man would say. I have the power. Um, so this is assembly disk. All right. Um, now, what's the easiest way to do this? I should probably just go to, let me just go ahead and assemble it. So we're going to run, um, what is it called? Is it called Pong 1 ASM? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, I, I switched to 6809. I'm rusty with this, right? So I'm going to type ASSEM. Um, Pong 1 space VCC. Right. And that will assemble it. That will stick it in the disk and that will launch the emulator. And here we go, which now you guys can't see, but here it is. Oh, look at this. Of course, I'm not going to have the aspect ratio just right because I'm manually stretching it, but you get the idea here, right? Okay. Uh, so what, yeah, what we are looking at here as we're looking at three balls that are bouncing very smoothly, one pixel each. 
We've got different vectors. It looks like this one ball is moving very slowly. Some are moving faster than others. Um, they, they know when they reach a corner uh, or an edge, I should say, and they know when they've reached the border of the screen. And that's when they reverse their directions, their, their, their deltas, if you will, right? Um, and they bounce around. So this is the final product, right? This is what the source code is going to do. Um, are we going to look through the source code itself too, and, and do some of this, or you say is that where you're saying no? Just do your homework and look at it yourselves. We're not going to do, do it on do the you, show. Do, yeah, yeah. Okay. Do. I mean, if you want to put up the source code for a few minutes on there, but I don't yeah, wanna, yeah. Don't, All right. So this is the it. final product. When you the the latest disk image that Steve has provided us, uh, this source code is going to create this effect for us. All right. So um, and honestly, I love it. It's super smooth. Um, you Especially know, I, when overlapping balls, because you could see in some of the older Coco 1 and 2 games in the day, they used to flicker like crazy if you had two sprites over top of them. Right. Now, are you still doing like a weight cycle in here to slow it down? Is it, would this be going much faster if you didn't make it wait, Steve? Oh, yeah. It would go much faster. But what I'm doing is I'm synchronizing to that 60 hertz interrupt. Uh huh. So it's basically frame locked the game. Okay. So, so is this running at 60 frames per second? Yep. Do you have an estimate of how much uh, time your program's taking uh, overall? I mean, how much time is left over that could still be used for something else? Oh, there, there's definitely a, a bit of time. Now, I will admit that the uh, sprite draw routine is not as efficient as possible. And currently, this, this sprite draw routine does not have clipping. That clipping allows the ball to actually slide off the screen. Right. And it's without its part of its image showing up on the other side of the screen so uh but that is something that we'll eventually get into on one of the lessons now what i'm looking at for the next lesson which is lesson 13, 13. lucky number Not, 13 yeah my slide says 12. <laughs> anyways lucky 13. we're going to talk about collision so our two balls will actually the balls on the screen will actually collide and and knock off from each other. Oh, neat. So neat. so they'll bounce on each other. And the way to make this work perfectly is I'll be changing the way that the balls are moving. They'll actually be moving on a vector. Okay. So what you have is a given uh, vector or line for the direction for the ball to move and its speed. And this makes it a lot easier to calculate the collisions of the balls bouncing off of each other. So that will be fun. Okay. Yep. And of course, once again, the 6209 is very good for doing vectors. All right, and now we're looking at your source code here and we see some of your comments. Moving three ping pong balls across lesson 12 by Steve Bjork. And here's our system port uh, things that you've set up here. So in, in your commenting and your and your and your object names make the say like Curtis says very almost self um, labeling and self explanatory, right? So you have your SAM V reg V mode registers of your SAM three bits, number of bits per V mode, graphics mode, P mode four. I mean you're breaking all this kind of stuff down for us here, explaining it all. Mm -hmm. um, here's your memory map that you explained. Yeah. By the way, on those labels, one thing I do do is I try to use upper and lower case in a way mm -hmm. of, you know, like every time a label has like two words, the second mm -hmm. word will be capitalized. Yeah. yeah. Camel Some case. other people, yeah. they'll use an underscore to separate the words, but right. I just do uh, capitalization. Yeah. Okay. It's just personal preference on that. Yeah. yeah. Um. No, and the source code, is, it's easy to read, the, the formatting of the source code and everything else. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah, I am curious now. I know we're not going to go into this now, but I'm going to do my homework, and I, I'm going to try to figure out what you're doing to generate random numbers. Yeah. Uh, here, here's your masking that you talked about in your slide here. Mm -hmm. There's the uh, reverse ball. This is the negative ball, the positive ball, and this is our other blanks. Um, B sprite 1, B sprite 2, B sprite 3. Mm -hmm. uh, X plus plus, that's a 16-bit number, so there's our um, our um, floating point, right? Right. Um, yeah, when yeah. I'm doing the mask part, I have to start with a um, basically a carry, carry set, 
as I'm shifting things in because mm -hmm. you want all the new bits to be a one. And when you're making the actual image of the uh, dot, you want them to shift in a zero. So there's a little difference between each one. Okay, so now we're getting into pseudo random number generator based on a 16 bit. Uh, I can't even pronounce that word. Galoy? Galoy yep. linear feedback shift register? <laughs> yep. Uh, this is the one I put uh, like last March in Discord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I grabbed a copy of that. Hey, Bruce. Hey. How's it going, eh? Hey, yeah. it's going great, eh? Hey, beauty, eh? We got two uh, token Canadians on the show. Yeah. yeah. Now, one thing about uh, pseudo random number generators is they have to have a seed. That's the actual thing they'll be shifting around. Mm. And if you always start with the same seed, you yeah. always get the same net random numbers in the same order. Right. And that's and good if you want to do something the same each time. Later lessons, I'll explain how to create a random seed. Okay. Clear both high res screens, disable the fast and normal interrupts, reset the stack pointer. Uh, yeah, all right, so I'm going to dig into this source code. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to it. You got a lot of lines of code here. Uh, yeah. You got end start, 487 lines of code. Um, yeah, I was for, kind of busy this last week. <laughs> well, I can't, can't thank you enough for doing that. So, um, Man, this is this is neat, you know what I mean? And for me, for the longest time, I've been listening and absorbing and trying to grasp what I can when it's been theoretical. Now, between what Paul Fiscarelli has given us with this this environment and, and, um, and now that we're getting this kind of more hands-on, let's look at some code. Listen, I couldn't look at this code and know everything you're doing, but based on your first 10 lessons where you've given us that foundation, I can take some really educated looks at this and, and learn and actually learn and not have it be completely random. So, um, and now this is neat. This is neat. This is really now, neat. Now, the other thing too is that, you know, I'm definitely on Discord and we have a section called assembly. That would be a good spot to put your questions in because I'm sure we're going to have them. And just like a, uh, an instructor at the university, you know, those are my office hours put in discord and actually if if some if there's enough people and you want to do a uh, kind of a you know a discussion in our uh chat section that's fine too we just got to schedule a time when we all can be there yeah okay and hopefully we can record it too so that people that aren't on discord or don't have access to discord can follow up on it later on too also people can email questions if they once again, are not on Discord, and we can you know bring it up next week. Yep, as, as uh, kind of a pre preview before we get to the next lesson. Okay, there was one question in the live chat, and we're going to take a break here in a minute. But John Laurie says, "Can you talk about controlling the speed not based on the processor because this program runs the same speed regardless of the CPU speed?" That's right, and that's where um, I mentioned earlier about uh, I've locked the frame rate into the vertical sync in other words um, a video display generates its image 60 times a second and that's exactly what i've locked into is just that it's uh every time this 60 hertz interrupt comes around mm -hmm. it allows the game to move forward one frame okay so if we did the double speed poke on this thing it would still be running at the same speed because the interrupt is still 60 hertz that's exactly right yeah okay um, It'll just give you more time to do stuff between frames. Right. And so then I would also say, John, if you want, you can download his disk image and look at the source code. And if you want <laughs> a deeper dive into that, that's your homework, as Steve yeah. said. So We should mention that if you have a PAL Coco, it'll be 50 hertz. So it'll yeah. be 50 times per second. Yeah. That's the reason why the games are slightly slower in Europe. Oh, okay. I thought it had something to do with the education or something like that. No. Okay. I get it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, he's trying to stir controversy. <laughs> uh, send your hate mail to Steve's probe. <laughs> um, Rob Inman says actual uh, thing that goes through and creates other objects that are used in the game based on what's going on. 
Yeah, and so and John Laurie says, does this help with the tearing and the flicker too? And I think I think that answer is self evident, right? The fact that there is no blinking here whatsoever, even though you are erasing every frame. Um, because because we're flipping between screens. Now, my, my method of doing this in basic from the old days was just slightly different where using get and put buffers, I would every, before I put something on there, I would get what was behind it, I would put everything, and once everything was put, then I would copy the whole composited image to the viewable page, and then I'd go back and restore everything and rinse, lather, and repeat. Um, you're talking about not even actually having to copy because if you do the copy, that's really slowing things down. So now you're just changing the pointer to what screen we're looking at, which is faster than having to copy the whole thing over, right? Exactly. Um, I'm, where, just I'm just changing what needs to be changed. Yeah. Um, so, but I so I have done a I've done my own version of double buffering based on a, a process I came up with in Basic using get put and p copy. Um, so uh, no, but it's neat because if not, yeah. you, we, because they aren't real sprites, we have to. Paste and erase, paste and erase, and that process automatically generates flicker. So, what do you do to negate the uh, the appearance of that flicker, right? Um, and so, like on certain Apple II games, like I remember playing like Hard Hat Mac. There's a lot of Apple II games where they don't do that. They almost do like an XOR, an exclusive OR, where if the background is black, we are white. But when you have things on top of things, they kind of reverse each other out. I've seen that on a lot of Apple games, um, and I guess that's just for the, the sake of efficiency, so we don't have the time to copy entire pages or whatever, so we just do it this way? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, somebody on Discord this last week was, you know, asking, you know, how much graphics memory can be updated or changed um, in a 60 hertz frame, and you're lucky if you can get 4K of data in and out uh, yeah. on, a, on a screen. Because, you know, it's not just moving the data. You also have to deal with clipping and byte boundaries. And then you also have, have game logic that's going Reading on. Reading joysticks and keyboard and play, playing sounds, all kinds of stuff's in there, too. Dealing with all your positions and your deltas and your flag states and your object states. There's a lot going on there. Your game loop, your logic, yeah. collision Your detection. two options there is basically you make the game not have a whole ton of stuff you have to redraw every every frame like just you know like a standard arcade game might have like 10 sprites of mm -hmm. you know, little shapes you're not drawing that much on the screen physically yeah. or the other one is to drop your frame rate down and maybe do it every third v-sync or you know mm -hmm. so it's 120th yeah. of a second to the 160th yeah okay. and one of the things that um i should also be pointed out there is that you don't necessarily have to run at 60 frames per second you can run at 30 uh, some of the games were locked in in the old days down to about 15 frames per second, which is a little rougher and, mm. uh, uh, you know, an action video game. You really don't want to go under. Who's got the freaking TV in the background there? Oops, I think sorry. of that was Bruce. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. We're, we're sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. but, but yeah, basically that's the thing is you may have to lower the frame rate. Uh huh. Uh, now I, I I remember even on on game systems that had hardware based sprites, what they had to do I'm assuming is that if they needed more sprites on screen than the hardware supported, they would have to turn it off in one spot and turn it off and turn it on in another, and then you ended up getting flickering on sprite hardware based games because oh. they were having to manipulate more sprites than were physically supported by the hardware. Is that why they flickered, or was there another reason why sprites well, that, flickered? That's definitely why they flickered. I mean, one yeah. of the most uh, criminal cases of that was the original Pac-Man for the Atari 2600. Yeah. I mean, so, the ghosts were ghosts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's... Uh, that's <laughs> The ghosts were ghosts. <laughs> I was wondering when you'd pick up on that. Yeah, it's yeah, the ghosts were ghosts. Yeah, they were definitely... Uh, there was no um, alpha channel blending <laughs> capability back then, so you couldn't achieve translucency. But um, they did uh, <laughs> they did a pretty good job with their blinkies, huh? Uh, well, you know, and the funny thing is, when they finally did the Ms. Pac-Man, there were so many complaints about the original Pac-Man. They uh -huh. they spent a little bit more time and did it right. Yeah, yeah. So good stuff. I was going to mention too on the Eor example that you gave Steve uh, that you saw in some of the Apple II games that. Uh, OS9 for drawing the mouse cursors and stuff does that same technique because it was quicker and easier 
to do yeah. rather than having background masks and savings. You don't have a cursor, like a mouse cursor that floats above everything. It just exclusive ores of whatever's underneath, which means to restore it back to normal, you just exclusive ore it a second time and it just immediately bumps you didn't, back. You didn't even have to do a buffer. You just inverted yeah. what was there. Yeah. Yeah, and then you invert it back, and then it looks like normal. So buffers, we don't need no stinking buffers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul just brought up uh, racing the beam, which is a great book, as I recall. And that was about trying to program the uh, Atari twenty six hundred, and yeah. I, I literally knew somebody that went nuts, crazy, literally, uh, after programming a number of games on that system. He saw fireballs chasing him around. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to point out a few things about where we're, where, where we've gone from to where we are now with the series, just from my own perspective. And I just want to start off again, just by saying thank you, uh, Steve Bjork for, for doing this. You're donating your time and your experience and your knowledge. Um, you know, it, it's been a slow and steady progress to get to where we are. We, we took 10 episodes, you know, we spent probably, you know, 10 to 18 hours of time, laying this foundation and and you could argue that you know well gosh why don't we just get to this and why don't we do this and do that but for me because this is all new it is so much easier for me to grasp this now by taking that slow process of building up that foundation that you did um and you've mentioned this curtis has mentioned this people who program in assembly you know you mentioned there's there's many ways to do it so we mm -hmm. could even now if somebody wanted to be critical and start looking at your source code and say well i would have done this or i could have done this or you could have done this but part of what you're doing is you're presenting it in a way that's going to be easy for us to follow and you've even yep. mentioned that this is not the most optimized or efficient way to do a sprite but it is a way now since i would not know at all how to create a sprite the fact you've given us anything um is great you know um and so we have all these things now and um yeah i like it i like it a lot i'm, I'm still i would say my comprehension is maybe 40 percent of what it needs to be <laughs> but that's better than the zero percent i was 12 weeks ago and for the past 40 years before that you know so the fact that i feel like i understand this and i feel like i can actually um start doing something and you're you're definitely giving us some tools to help us shorten that process and that learning curve um i think is great um uh, you know, it'd be like another, another one of my bucket list items is I want to learn how to play guitar. I mean, right now, this is like, it's like having Eric Clapton show us how to play a guitar, you know? So it's, it's a similar thing like this. We're learning some like master techniques and the end of this, we're, we're getting this wisdom and everything else that's coming with it. Um, I think it's cool. So, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. I, I like to think of this technique being used here as uh, op optimized for understandability. <laughs> yeah, not that's for perfect. speed not for size for understanding it yeah optimize for learning right mm -hmm. um and, and purposely a lot of the code is put in there in certain ways to you know like okay i've got sprite zero in the uh, program data space and i build the other seven in ram i could have just put it in the program data space but it gave me a chance to show a routine where I'm shifting information around so you can study that. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. But the idea, once again, is it's really tough to go through and shift information around. So we build pre-build the sprites. So we're just blasting the data in bite hey, Steve, by bite. Yes. You're, you're putting these in Creative Commons, right? So people can use them for their own uh, devices. Uh, yeah. Essentially, they're going Creative Commons. I haven't bothered putting on the source code even a copyright message so right. but it's technically for me i consider creative commons all right Thank well you. let's um let's go ahead and take a break and then we'll come back and hopefully steve you can still stay with us but i definitely want to get into some more stuff we'll hit some we'll hear some feedback um some comments and and, and stuff to this um and uh and, and yeah this vetrix has been in the background the whole time and another thing on my wish list is i would love to have a vetrix system um, I was in love with the Vectrix. Oh, the Vector Vector arcade games uh, were just so, there was something so unique about them, especially when they got into color. Um, but yeah, my earliest games in the arcade, my memories are of like Asteroids and Lunar Lander. You know, Space War the, for me. That you know, um, uh, Tail Gunner was another one. Obviously, like um, what was the tank one? Uh, the 3D tank from Atari. 
Battle Zone. Uh, Battle Zone. Yeah, there's so many. at Star Wars. Star Wars Arcade, the, the first one with the vectors, probably one of the most immersive video game experiences that borderline simulation for its time, you know. Well, while cool we've stuff. been talking here for a little while, Williams has been putting up different uh, Vectrex games. And I go, yeah. oh, yeah, I remember playing. That was a fun one. Oh, yeah, that yeah. was great. <laughs> like, yeah. games were really more about gameplay because, you know, just... You know, the vector graphics are somewhat limited to a certain degree, but man, it was just about the gameplay of the games and like that. And the other thing too it was tough for them to license the games. Uh, the best title I think they licensed was, uh, I think, um, Star Castle. Was it? Mm. That's one of the rotating shields in the middle. You have to shoot. Oh yeah, stuff. The, yeah. that was an awesome game. Yeah, but um, yeah, I, I wish I could hang around for that segment later. Yeah. Uh, but right. I, I've got a heart out in five minutes. Okay. Uh, well, how about we just spend the next five minutes with you, Steve, while you're here before we take a break. Okay, sure. Um, uh, questions, comments, feedback for Steve Bjork while he's still here, everybody. Keep up Crick the good work. Crickets. Down <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at your feet. Yeah, I'm looking through the stuff. I'm not seeing too much in the way of comments that we haven't already took care of. Okay. I think until so, people actually get to download the code, take a look at it, then they might the yeah. questions might start happening. You know, True. I don't understand what you're doing here or what this means or whatever. Yeah, of course, uh, one guy's comment is everybody's got to now sign a NDA. <laughs> John Lowry uh, says, thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm sure he's talking yeah. to you, not me. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but uh, yeah, next week we're going to do collisions and we're going to do uh, how to calculate a, a vector. Yeah. Earlier, Jason Ooh. Downs. Jason Downs says this has been a really cool series. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Fiscarelli too has been commenting. Yeah, um, and there's Star Castle on the Vectrix there. Yeah, 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 just Paul. incredible. Speaking game. of the the Vectrix, since that's running a 6809, I wonder what extra um, performance you could get for more graphics if you could uh, toss in a 6309 in there. Yeah, I suggested that on my um, Ron's garage. Yeah, and someone so, told me. Uh, Curtis, yes. On the uh, sixty-three hundred nine, what improvements are done on the math copra, the the math instructions? Uh, you've got sine sixteen bit by sixteen bit multiply. You've got uh, sine sixteen by eight and thirty-two by sixteen divide. So that would help a little. That, that would, that would help. Would help. Yeah. And even and like looking the, at your vector flags in your in your uh, lesson today. I mean, when you're having to order those flags together, you could use the OIM and AIM and stuff like that to make it a little bit faster too. So. Mm -hmm keeping track of object lists and updating them. And just yeah. the fact that if you did it in native, native mode, it's automatically 20% faster anyways, without any optimizations, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So um, sounds like a win, win, win. But in order for all of that to be effective, somebody would have to go into the source code and um, actually then modify the source code to turn these things on, right? Start using these things. So yeah. We'd well, have to the, other, the other thing I would also like to mention too on the Vectrex is that you got to spend so much time actually drawing the images on the screen if you do it too fast the line is too light ah good point yeah because it's phosphor where it basically lights it up and it glows and slowly dims off and if you yeah, try yeah. to draw lines too fast it doesn't have time to really light them up yep well if you've got extra cpu time that means you'd have more time for uh game logic then yes yeah yeah 
but you're going to you're going to find that like in the pong game 90 percent of the time that we're spent doing any work is drawing the screen and erasing the screen and doing screen stuff very little is actually spent on game logic as far as time goes hmm that means there's plenty of room for sound routines. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've just been joined by the madman, Simon Jonason, too. Hello, Simon. Good. Good. Uh, well, for you, it'd be good evening, right? It's about 8 p.m. for you. Yeah, 2014 right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Steve Bjork. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're now we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll take a break here in just a minute. This concludes another episode of Coco Talk the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things Coco Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the Tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8 Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, click the Patreon link at our website at cocotalk.live. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world. Coco Talk would not exist without the community, its cast, crew, and contributors. Thanks go to Curtis Boyle, David Ladd, Mark Overholzer, Grant Leedy, Bruce Moore, Nick Marenkis, Ron Delvo, Rick Adams, Jason Riker, Richard Lorbieski, Jim Brain, Tom C., Rob Inman, Mark Bosley, Brian Joyce, Ken Riker, David O'Connor, Brian Weasler, Terry Steggy, Nick Moroda, John Strong, and many more, especially to Steve Bjork for production suggestions and James Diffendaffer for making my head explode. Please help support the Coco community by visiting some of its various contributors. A list of resources is available at imacoconut.com. That's I-M-A-C-O-C-O-N-U-T dot com. The Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Sheeler. Mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. <laughs>